Buckle up, kids. We got a long one here. This is Matt with State of Flex here with my Oscar predictions for who will win on Oscar night, as well as my top five picks for the best movies of the year. Were I doing the Oscars? Now, I want to say two quick things. Number one, I got to see almost every single Oscar nominated film with the exception of one pretty big one. It's one of the uh, best picture nominees, which is pretty disappointing. And that movie uh, is American fiction. I, I wish I'd gotten a chance to see it. And there's a small chance that uh, as of this recording, I haven't seen it, but as of the day it uploads, I will have seen it and have posted at the very, very end of this video, my thoughts on it. Uh, the other thing I want to address is that I'm gonna do a quick little rundown of what I think of each of the 10 nominees before I go in and give my predictions for who will win everything, every category coming up. Now, if you want to skip uh, ahead, I will be putting chapters in here so you can jump to a chapter that you are most interested in. That is, it, that is something that I welcome you to do. However, I urge you to watch the whole thing and hear what I have to say. Um, so, my thoughts on the 10 nominated Best Picture uh, nominees. Uh, American Fiction, I haven't seen. I've heard it's spectacular. I have multiple people in my life that tell me it is the best movie that they've seen of the nominees, and we'll see if I agree with that. Uh, I should have a re review up either at the end of this video or in the next couple of days for you for that film. Anatomy of a Fall is a spectacular drama circling around a fractured family uh, where a death happens and the family is put on trial for it. It is gripping storytelling. It is absolutely stunning to see um, the law landscape through a different country's purview. I just found this film endlessly fascinating, so well told, so well structured, so well written, so well acted. It good. You should watch. Uh, Barbie. Barbie earns its Best Picture nomination. It is one of the best films of the year, and in fact, if uh, I have a top five of the year, it would be in my top ten in the number ten spot. It is a spectacular movie that is better than several of the movies that are in fact nominated for Best Picture. So this isn't just a popularity prize that it got nominated, which I feel like the Academy treated it as. It earns that nomination. It is that good. It's funny, and it's okay to watch a film that is silly and still think that there is good to be had there. The movie never talks down to you, which some people will argue that it does. It doesn't. If you feel talked down to, maybe it's because you are being triggered by some of the things that it is kind of exposing about yourself. And also, why must we have a problem with a movie that um, lays very simply what it has to say. In a world that has gotten as complicated as, as it is, being talked to or exposed to a uh, thought or an ideology in very simple terms isn't a bad thing. And let's not forget that Barbie is a product designed for young people. And young people need simpler terms to be talked to uh, and under, uh, in order to understand what they are viewing. There's a reason this film is popular, there's a reason this film resonates. It is that good and one of my favorite films of 2023. Moving on to The Holdovers. This is a film that I'm definitely going to revisit every holiday season. Probably not for Christmas like a lot of people are saying, but for me this is a great New Year's movie. I absolutely love it. It captures drama in a way that is uh, it has no artifice. It doesn't feel artificial in any sense. It feels real and it feels so well um, executed. The characters, you want to spend more time with them and you're disappointed when the film comes to an end because you know that you don't necessarily have that opportunity unless a sequel happens or follow up some years on down the line, which I don't believe will. I loved this and I can't wait to revisit it come New Year's. We have up next, Killers of the Flower Moon is a fantastic movie. I was kind of sleeping on it for a bit. You may have seen my review earlier uh, in the month uh, for this film. I liked it, uh, but it's one that I has, has got me thinking about it more and more. And uh, I think it's Scorsese's second best film. I really, really enjoyed this movie. It is well acted, well paced. Um, 
it, especially in that last hour. It's the the first hour is good. The last hour is phenomenal. That middle chunk is where I, I get hung up a little bit. But um, excellent performances, especially from Lily Gladstone and DiCaprio. Uh, they really help raise the film. The film does have its flaws. I address them in my um, my review, which you can watch. But it is a good, if not great, movie. Um, Maestro. It's an honor to be nominated. Uh, Oppenheimer. We'll touch on Oppenheimer again in a little bit. It's a movie that I personally think is a bit overblown. I like it. I think it's uh, uh, Christopher Nolan's best film since Inception. Um, but even still, it, I think it's a poorly written, insanely well executed uh, technical filmmaking achievement. Um, but I, I do not like that screenplay and that holds me back from really singing the praises of it. Past Lives, I think, is the best nominated picture for this nom uh, nomination season. It is so good. It's a film that lingers with you long after you uh, watch it because it emotionally resonates with pretty much everybody who is able to tap into a what-could-have-been scenario with past people in our lives and how they kind of flit in and out of them. Uh, it's an exceptionally well-made movie, beautifully shot, and uh, Greta Lee helps to elevate the hell out of it with her grounded yet phenomenal performance. And it is a shame that she was overlooked for this film. Uh, Poor Things, I think, is the worst of the nominated films I've seen. I hear that American Fiction is fantastic, so I have no reason to believe otherwise. I think Poor Things should not have been nominated. I think the film... I, I can't get behind Yargos Lanthimos, the way he photographs his movie, the fish lens thing, does nothing for me. The fact that it's shifting between the fish lens to like the flat full screen to the fish lens again, and it, it's, it just looks sloppy to me. And then on top of that, it's taking the born sexy yesterday trope and doing a feministic spin. However, I feel like the feminism angle that it's taking is dated by 15 years or so. I think 15 years ago, if I would have seen this movie, I would have absolutely loved it. But as of now, it just feels like it's a story told from from the wrong perspective, like not the film's perspective, but the wrong person telling this story. I don't think that he is the one that should have been telling this story of this woman sort of enacting in her own agency. I just, I, I did not like this movie and I really wanted to. I'm all for the exploration of sexual liberation uh, with a young woman and uh, experiencing that, but did a male lens need to be placed on it so heavily? I really struggled with that. Uh, not in love with poor things. And then Zone of Interest is another one that you may have seen my review for. It's a film that I like. I think the first 40 minutes or so are phenomenal. I think this would have made a great 40-minute short film. However, uh, I didn't think that it needed to continue on after its 40 minutes. That said, well, I like this movie. I found that this film is the most fascinating conversation starter, and it's gotten me to ruminate on... Uh, everything going on within the film, but how it relates to present day, especially a Trumpian style America that we have lived in. Uh, the complacency of allowing certain things to happen and we just won't speak about it because we are tending to our garden and able to ignore that which we uh, recognize as ugly, but don't want to recognize within ourselves that we are uh, buying into that. So, Zone of Interest, very good movie, uh, but um, one that I think I like to talk about more than I would ever want to revisit. Um, those are the nominees. From this point forward, I am going to give you just purely who I think will win in each category. Um, so, who wins Best Picture? I think it's going to be Oppenheimer. There's a small chance that Oppenheimer does not take that Best Picture win. If that happens, I think part of me thinks that Poor Things might have the strength to take it. Maybe Zone of Interest. 
um, or even American fiction uh, that's been gaining a little bit of, a tra uh, of traction in the past couple of days. So you might see that happen. But I think this is Oppenheimer's award to lose. It will be Oppenheimer. And I've come to terms with that. Best actor in a leading role. We have Bradley Cooper for Maestro, Coleman Domingo for Rustin, Paul Giamatti for The Holdovers, Killian Murphy for Oppenheimer, and Jeffrey Wright for American Fiction. I think it will be Killian Murphy. It might be uh, Paul Giamatti. The dark horse contender would probably be Jeffrey Wright. He's also been in the conversation a little more in the past weeks, so, uh, so it could be him, but I think Killian Murphy gets this. Best Supporting Actor. We have Sterling K. Brown, Robert De Niro, Robert Downey Jr., uh, Ryan Gosling, and Mark Ruffalo. I don't think we live in a world where Robert Downey Jr. does not win. He, I think, will win if somebody takes it from him. I think it's going to be his uh, avenging buddy Mark Ruffalo for poor things. I don't see it happening. Robert Downey Jr., good luck with your Oscar win. Um, let's see. Best Actress in a Leading Role. We have Annette Benning for Niad, Niad which is a quite a good film uh, on Netflix. Check it out. Lily Gladstone for Killers of the Flower Moon. Sandra Hewler for Anatomy of a Fall. Carrie Mulligan for Maestro. Emma Stone for Poor Things. As much as I love Carrie uh, Mulligan in Maestro, Lily Gladstone will probably win this uh, Oscar. It could go to Emma Stone. I would not be satisfied if that happened uh, because A, she's won, and I think she won for a substantially better film, but uh, she also uh, didn't blow me away with the movie. Um, dark Horse contender here would be Sandra Hewler. Um, could even go to Annette Bening. She's gotten a lot of support from the, the Oscars, but never secured that win. She's sort of like Peter O'Toole of our uh, current times. Uh, best Supporting Actress. We have Emily Blunt for Oppenheimer, Danielle Brooks for The Color Purple, America Ferreira for Barbie, Jodie Foster for Nyad, and uh, Divine Joy, uh, Joy Randolph for The Holdovers, and Divine Joy Randolph wins this. Uh, she's earned it. It's a fantastic performance. Um, if anybody could take her down, I think possibly Danielle Brooks for Color Purple. She was a standout in the film, but I, I just don't see it happening. Uh, my heart would be happy if like America Ferreira pulled a win. I loved her performance. Uh, best animated feature film. We have The Boy and the Heron, Elemental, Nimona, Robot Dreams, Spider-Man Across the Universe. This is really a competition between two films, Boy and the Heron or Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. Just with some of the uh, critiques that were around uh, Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse with how it handled its animation uh, output, and how uh, it is an incomplete film. I think Boy and the Heron will pull the win, but it could go to Spider-Man. Best Cinematography, El Conde, Killers of the Flower Moon, Maestro Oppenheimer, and Poor Things. If Poor Things wins for cinematography, I will punch my face. Um, I think this is Oppenheimer will win. Uh, my heart goes to El Conde. I think that movie is gorgeous looking. Uh, but Oppenheimer wins that. Costume design, Barbie, Killers of the Flower Moon, Napoleon, Oppenheimer, Poor Things. I think that this is a fight between Barbie and Poor Things. I think Barbie wins it. Poor Things might pull a win, and it would be somewhat deserved. I do like the costumes in that film, but come on, Barbie. Uh, let's go party. Uh, directing, we have uh, Justine Triette for Anatomy of a Fall, Martin Scorsese for Killers of the Flower Moon, Christopher Nolan for Oppenheimer, Yargos Lanthimos for Poor Things, or Jonathan Glazer, The Zone of Interest. I think this is either going, er, this is definitely going to be Christopher Nolan. If anybody can pull it from him, I think it's Jonathan Glazer uh, for uh, Zone of Interest, but Christopher Nolan. I think has the most sure win of anybody this Oscar season. Best documentary feature. We have Bobby Wynn, the uh, er, Bobby Wine, the People's President. That is a phenomenal movie. If you have Disney Plus, check it out. That movie is extraordinarily good. Uh, I really, really appreciated that one. We have The Eternal Memory, one of my favorite films of the year, and something that will 
come back to later on this evening. Uh, Four Daughters, which just dropped on Netflix. I do plan on checking this one out. To Kill a Tiger, the only one that I for sure will not have access to. And 20 Days in Mario Pool. Uh, I think 20 Days in Mario Pool is the most important film that came out in 2023. Uh, it will win, but my heart really wants The Eternal Memory to win. I adored that film, and for your interest, 20 Days in Mario Pool, The Eternal Memory, and Bobby Wine, The People's President, all made my top 10 movies of the year. So this is a stacked documentary feature uh, nomination round. Check out those three films. They are all phenomenal movies. Best documentary short? I actually got a chance to see all of them. The ABCs of Book Banning was my personal favorite. The Barber of Little Rock was a good little uh, short. A lot of these are on YouTube. Uh, Island In Between was an interesting little kind of anecdote about uh, a sort of conflict that uh, you'd never think existed. The Last Repair Shop is the most glossy of the bunch and quite pretty and very good. And uh, Nai Nai and Wai Pao, uh, I might have butchered that, uh, is on Disney and that one's just cute because the two characters, or two people are, the two subjects are very adorable. Uh, I think this is a fight between The Last Repair Shop and the ABCs of book banning. I loved ABCs of book banning so much I think that wins it, but it could go to The Last Repair Shop. Film editing. We have Anatomy of a Fall, The Holdovers, Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, and Poor Things. Um, I think that Oppenheimer wins this kind of without question. Uh, Anatomy of a Fall does have some really slick uh, editing that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Um, international feature, we have Yo Capitano, Perfect Days, Society of the Snow, The Teacher's Lounge, and The Zone of Interest. I'd be shocked if Zone of Interest didn't win. If any of them could pull it off, maybe Society of the Snow, maybe Perfect Days, but I think this is Zone of Interest's year without question. Uh, makeup and Hairstyling, Golda, um, Maestro, Oppenheimer, Four Things, and Society of the Snow. Uh, I think Maestro wins this. Uh, there is a small chance that Poor Things does, but I really do think Maestro is going to pull a victory here. For best original score, we have American Fiction. I really did not like that score. I listened to the complete scores for all five of these films. Uh, I did not like American Fiction. Uh, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny. That was my favorite of the, uh, or no, it wasn't. Uh, it was one of my favorite of the nominees. I really liked it. I didn't pay attention to it much when I saw the film, but upon um, uh, listening to exclusively the score, this is a very lovely score. John Williams really nailed it. Killers of the Flower Moon by Robbie Robertson. That is my favorite score of the year. I really like the Killers of the Flower Moon score. Uh, fantastic nomination. Um, I don't think that it wins, which is heartbreaking because Robbie Robertson did pass away, uh, and uh, he deserves the, no uh, the nomination. He deserves the win, in my opinion. Then you have Oppenheimer and Poor Things. I think Oppenheimer's Ludwig Gorenson wins. He's won before. That's why I would like to see Killers of the Flower Moon take it. But Oppenheimer wins for Best Original Score, Best Original Song. We have The Fire Inside from Flamin' Hot, I'm Just Ken from Barbie, It Never Went Away from American Symphony, uh, Wahazi Hahizi, sorry, from Killers of the Flower Moon, A Song for My People, um, and What Was I Made For from Barbie. Uh, my favorite one uh, is go down that list. It's a uh, ascent to the best. I think... What was made for? What was I made for? Is the best song? I think it wins. Um, production design: Barbie, Killers of the Flower Moon, Napoleon, Oppenheimer, Poor Things. I think Barbie wins. If anybody can upset it, I think it's uh, Poor Things or Oppenheimer. But I think production design goes to Barbie. Uh, best animated short film: Letter to a Pig, Ninety Five Senses, Our Uniform, Psychodermy, and War Is Over, inspired by the music of. John and Yoko. This is the only category where I didn't see a single nomination. I've seen almost every single thing in this list. I could not find any of those five nominees and it broke my wee little heart. That said, I think War is Over wins. I'm just pulling blindly out of a bag. Uh, live action short, I was able to see these. 
Uh, the After is my favorite. Uh, that one's on Netflix. Invincible Night of Fortune, which is also on YouTube, quite good. Red, White, and Blue, and The Wonderful Story of Henry Sugar, which I hated, and I think wins. So, way to go, Wes Anderson. You're ruining my life. Uh, sound. Uh, for sound, we have The Creator, Maestro, Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning, Part 1, which no longer is a Part 1. Uh, Oppenheimer and the Zone of Interest. I think Zone of Interest wins, pulling an upset over Oppenheimer. However, if it doesn't, Oppenheimer wins. Uh, best visual effects. We have The Creator, Godzilla Minus One, Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1, No Longer Part 1, and Napoleon, I think Godzilla. I think Godzilla does it, and if it does, you're going to see me squee as loud as can be. I am so rooting for Godzilla. Uh, we'll talk more about Godzilla later. Uh, Alright, moving on to the last two nominees. We have writing, best adapted screenplay. We have American Fiction, Barbie, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and The Zone of Interest. I think Barbie wins. If Barbie doesn't win, it's going to go to American Fiction. However, I do think the snubbing in a couple other uh, key categories is going to help um, Barbie. Also, the fact that it is weird that it's in an adapted screenplay could be the thing that hurts it. Um, but I, I feel like that uh, being in adapted screenplay is in itself a snub, and that's why people are going to vote Barbie for best adapted screenplay. Could be American fiction. Best Original Screenplay, Anatomy of a Fall, The Holdovers, Maestro, May, December, Past Lives. Um, I think Anatomy of a Fall wins. Past Lives is my favorite of the nominees. The Holdovers could win, but I think Anatomy of a Fall wins. Now looking at my top five movies of the year. In number five spot, we have Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. This is a very strong movie, the strongest comic book movie we've had since uh, Spider-Man No Way Home, and it is uh, incredibly emotionally resonant and saying something about uh, the treatment of animals and life in general in our society that people are uh, kind of sleeping on that aspect of the film. It is incredibly strong, incredibly emotionally resonant for that reason, and one of my favorite films of 2023. In the number four spot, we have Past Lives, the only nominee from the ten that made my top five. And Past Lives, as I said before, is a beautiful film that gets you to ruminate on your own life and your own opportunities, missed or not missed, depending on how your life went. The people that you share time with, that you truly love, matter in ways that might expand beyond your current existence. And that film uh, really helped illustrate that. I think it's a beautiful film, and it's one that I will be revisiting from time to time uh, in, in the near beyond. Um, my number three choice uh, for the longest time had the top spot, but is John Wick Chapter 4. This is not only a slick action film, it is a really cool... Uh, conclusion to the John Wick saga. It has some great character moments. It's a neat revision of the good, the bad, and the ugly in a modern uh, setting. It has the best lighting I've seen for any film this year. It is genuinely the best looking movie of 2023, uh, Fight Me. Um, I am not a person that particularly likes gun fu kind of movies. Um, there are some that I kind of gravitate towards, most of them are directed by John Woo, but this is the pinnacle of quality that you can get from that, and easily the best film of its franchise, which is admittedly a, a pretty solid action franchise. This transcends that. This is a film that has a little more to say, it has a story, it has stuff going on, it is that good, and it got me to roll tears. Who would have thought that Keanu Reeves, the boy who couldn't act, uh, could get me to, to roll some tears. Excellent film. Um, my number two spot 
is the documentary nominated for an Oscar this year, The Eternal Memory. That is a lovely film uh, that exposes two Chilean celebrities, an actress and a um, uh, journalist, a uh, television journalist, who uh, are deeply in love, yet he has come down with Alzheimer's. And you're exploring the uh, his life, their life, really, um, as they navigate a pandemic and try to hold on to those memories of a life of love and uh, how they, uh, particularly he, affected change during a turbulent political time. This is the notebook, just real life, like sans the fantasy. Um, it is a beautiful film. Uh, and if you've been touched at all by Alzheimer's or dementia in any way uh, within your family, uh, I urge you to watch this film. It is extraordinary. It's streaming on Paramount Plus, uh, and I urge you to watch it. It is, a, it is a phenomenal film. And my number one movie for 2023 is, yes, Godzilla Minus One. That film is fantastic. It takes the very tired trope for this 70-year-old franchise and made it feel fresh again in ways that even 2016's Shin Godzilla couldn't. It made you care about the characters to the point where you didn't want Godzilla to come back on the screen because if he did, that only meant that the disruption of the characters that you are so bonded to is going to be fractured even more. This is a story of rebuilding and rebirth through the lens of the Japanese after some truly traumatic bombs are dropped during the World War II. This is a phenomenal counterpoint to Oppenheimer or a film that you could use as a companion piece to see all right, he feared what could happen to a world if uh, his bombs went off, yet he needed to make the bomb. What happened to the people who the bombs dropped on? And this is a ex stunning examination of that. And it just so happens to have a giant monster in it, a kaiju, that doesn't do anything to disrupt the film. It only amplifies the anguish that you feel while watching it. It is a phenomenal film. Yes, it gets a little like hokey at times in certain key ways, especially in its climax, but I don't think that that's a dissatisfying part of the experience. I think you yearn for that hokiness because you need things to just be all right. And I loved Godzilla minus one. That is my number one favorite film of 2023. That top five again is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. That is Past Lives. That is John Wick Chapter 4. That is The Eternal Memory. And finally, the best film of the year, Godzilla minus one. Thanks for watching. Give me your top five in the comments down below and let me know what you thought of my predictions. Am I off base? Let me know who you think is going to win Best Picture down below as well. And I'll see you tomorrow with a wrap-up of all the actuals. Thanks for watching. Peace. <laughs> I did it. I watched American Fiction. Uh, and and it, it, it's, it's American Fiction is a good movie. I can attest quality happened in front of my eyes. <sighs> full review tomorrow along with the full list of the Oscar winners and my thoughts. Booyah.